Our modern world is defined by convenience. From smartphones to cars, fashion to food, and it's becoming cheaper, smaller, and smarter than ever before. All made possible by the factory. We live a way of life that we simply could not live without the factory. Modern manufacturing fuels our consumption and gives us the means to wage wars on an unprecedented scale. But it has also allowed us to go further, faster. It has taken us to space. I think there's something quite marvelous watching people collaborate. This whir of activity moving in, in some synchronous motion, how does that happen? Revolutionary ideas come to life on the assembly line. The ever-evolving synchronous interaction of humans and machines that has made the modern world. Factories are the source of almost everything we use in our daily lives. It is the factory that produces our clothes, much of our food, our means to entertain ourselves and to communicate with others. Today, the factory feeds our ability to consume on an unprecedented scale. And that consumption in turn fuels a growing dependence on mass production. Each mass produced item we acquire, use and discard may seem insignificant, but that consumption is extrapolated across more than 7.5 billion people around the world. This cultural shift towards mass-produced goods was a 20th century phenomenon, enabled by changing technology and innovative thinking, and adopted in the changing climate of the post-World War II Western world. That really was the rise of American consumerism. That was the rise of our consumer republic. That was really the birth of the American dream, too, where Americans were no longer dirt poor. The average person had a quality of life and had access to consumer goods in a way that they had never before. This rise of a consumer society wasn't limited to America. It perpetuated around the world a change that is nowhere more apparent than in one of the most basic and most essential of consumer goods, food. Among the things of our good life is the vast array of food choices we have. The homes tailored and equipped to meet our individual needs. Humans have always been evolving technologies to do different things with their food. It's harder to see because the process was a lot slower, but the process is speeded up in the 20th century and into the 21st century. And I think that changes the way that we think about food, that it is something to be treated with technology. And that wasn't really a way of thinking about food for most of human history. When the factory became a step between the farm gate and the table, our entire way of life changed. From our shopping trends to the places we live and the technology we rely on in and out of the home. It is all thanks to the role of mass production in the food we consume. The first step was to find ways to make food last longer. Preserving food is something we have done for hundreds of years. Early techniques included fermenting, pickling, salting, smoking, and drying foods. Then, in the early 19th century, the canning process was invented. It was a revolutionary change, but it would take more than 100 years for consumer demand to grow enough to make it a viable, mass-produced product. Really until the 20th century, canned food, canned milk, canned meat was something that you took in a situation where there was no other way to get meat or milk. It was not until the 1920s that more things like soup and vegetables and fruits were commonly canned and were pushed into the consumer market. It's not that there was a, a demand for them from the consumer side, but that the technology became available. Can making was particularly slow at first, but invention succeeded invention and before too long machines were doing more in an hour than a man might do in a week. Since its inception, the process of canning goods hasn't really changed. It begins with prepping the food. This is the point in the process that varies most, depending on the type of food. Fruit is peeled, pitted, chopped, de-stemmed. 
Some vegetables are heat treated to remove bulk for packing. Seafood is boned or shelled, except for smaller fish. Meat and tuna are usually cooked first, deboned and compacted. The food is then canned, filled with water or juice and sealed. Canned foods are heated under steam pressure to around 116 to 121 degrees Celsius. The amount of time it's heated for depends on the acidity and density of the food and how well it can transfer heat. The amount of heat applied has to be incredibly precise. Once it reaches that point, the cans are quickly cooled. Today, canned goods are widely accepted as a safe way to preserve food. In the U.S. alone, there are 130 billion cans used each year, creating an $8 billion industry, comprising of 200 manufacturing plants across 38 states, employing more than 35,000 people. But when canned foods first entered the consumer market, it wasn't something that people wanted to eat or something they trusted for everyday use. The problem with canned foods for the industry is that you can't see inside. Generations of women who'd grown up canning their own cucumbers and strawberries and tomatoes in clear ball jars were a little skeptical about not being able to see inside because in generations past, poorly canned food had actually been responsible for whole families dying. It's pretty grim. Early adoption of canned foods was by armies. But by World War I, they were starting to become a feature of everyday homes. After World War II, they were marketed heavily as a staple for every housewife. Dole Fruit Cocktail provides a mighty tasty snack. Just as it from the can, it's perfect for any time of day, any kind of meal. So when you come out with a new product, of course, you have to convince people that it's, you know, either really, really useful or really, really wonderful, maybe both. The initial marketing for canned foods introduced them as a luxury. And it's so hard for us to imagine today that canned peas were anybody's idea of a treat. Growing demand for canned goods could only be met through the efficiencies of mass production. The earliest innovations of the 19th century took canning from a process that could produce five or six cans per hour to around 10 times that number. Most modern canning factories use a technology patented in 1904 to seal cans. It's known as the double seam technique. Each can sits on a turntable that spins it through two different rollers. The first roller folds down the lid over the lip of the can. The second roller folds and tightens them together, forming the double seam. Double seam machines can seal more than 2,000 cans a minute. While the process of canning food may make it last longer, it still needs to be fresh when it goes into the factory. Many canneries are within a few kilometers of the farms and docks where the food is sourced. Once the food was in the can, it could last for years. They did what preserving has always done, which is mess with the seasons. You can have a fresh spring pea in the middle of winter, or you can have what seems like an almost fresh strawberry in the middle of winter. So they're a way for humans to combat seasonality, which sometimes in our history has seemed like a good thing. Less fashionable now. Canning wasn't the only technology that changed the way we eat. Each day in countless ways, some electric appliance makes housework a little easier. Before refrigeration was reliable and cheap enough for everybody to have it, you had to think of your food as something that had to be used up as quickly as possible. Early fridges were expensive and complex to make, so complex that they couldn't be mass produced. And if they couldn't be mass produced, they couldn't be made to be affordable. The mass production problem was the compressor, which created the cooling. It was filled with noxious gas and needed to be airtight. Traditional welding techniques weren't sufficient. Then, General Electric scientists discovered that if you melted copper in hydrogen, it would seal cracks and crevices to a microscopic level. This meant they could finally mass produce the refrigeration mechanism sealed inside steel and have it last for years a discovery that made it possible to create the economy of scale needed to make fridges accessible to everyday people. With this innovation, General Electric created the monitor top, named for the conspicuous compressor sitting on top of the fridge. Sold between 1927 and 1936, 
it has been described as the Model T Ford of refrigerators. Before it, buying a fridge could cost you as much as a family car. In 1934, GE hired an industrial designer to streamline the look of their fridge. He moved the condenser from the top to the base, and in doing so, established a style that would set the trend for decades. While fridges were evolving into the consumer product we know them as today, the real revolution wouldn't take place until after World War II. I'd say certainly by the Second World War, refrigerators are common in most middle-class homes, certainly in urban areas, but often quite small. And people were still putting their milk out on the fire escape or the windowsill in the winter because that's a perfectly good way to keep something cold. In 1947, not long after the end of World War II, GE released their first two-door fridge freezer. Four years later, in 1951, they anticipated the exponential growth in demand for home appliances and bought 700 acres of land in Kentucky. Here, they would build the massive sprawling factory complex known as Appliance Park. By 1961, it had 10,000 workers and was producing 60,000 major appliances a week. The post-war rise of the suburban sprawl completely redefined the way we live, shop, and eat. Suddenly, your shopping day is completely different. There is no shopping day, right? You don't go from market to market getting the freshest things. You go once a week and you load up. So the kinds of things that you're buying need to be the kinds of things that you can load up with. And suburban homes also have space to store all of that stuff. This newly discovered space needed to be filled with appliances, including a refrigerator that could store the food you were now buying less frequently. Ah, yes, dear lady. Permafreeze is your kind of refrigerator. High, high quality at a low, low price. As the fridge became more successful, it paved the way for another important food manufacturing innovation one that relied on refrigeration. Frozen food emerged long before it was popularized by the growing demands of suburbia. Frozen foods as a commodity are the invention of Clarence Birdseye. Other people had experimented with it, but he figures out how to flash freeze things so that they keep their texture, right? So much of food and food technology is about texture. Birdseye applied his past experience watching Inuit people catch and preserve fish through quick freezing. He used this idea to create his own freezing technology. The first major step was known as multi-plate freezing. It involved two metal plates hollowed out and filled with an ammonia refrigerant to keep the temperature between minus 20 and minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Cartons of food were then pressed between the two plates to freeze the contents. Later, Bird's Eye changed the plates for belts chilled by a calcium chloride spray. This allowed for continuous movement on the production line and a much higher volume of frozen food. After World War II, frozen foods got caught up in the boom of food processing. This is part of the new world of food after the Second World War, where people are very excited about what technology can bring them. More and more of them, white middle-class people, are in settings where they can store this kind of stuff. They have big freezers. In 1950, frozen food sales had reached $500 million. In 1966, that had reached $6.245 billion. In 1999, $68 billion. By the end of the 20th century, there were around 40 million freezers and 120 million fridges in homes in the U.S. alone. Frozen meals even got a boost, thanks to the growing popularity of another invention. Ladies, one reason you can always trust the Swanson Frozen Dinner, it rounds the hungry edge of appetite nobly well. By the late 1950s, people begin to know about frozen dinners and to call them TV dinners. They're associated with the television age and with a different kind of coming together as a family. They are popular. They're expensive to begin with, just like canned foods. They enter the market as something desirable and special and then quickly become democratized so that everybody can have them. The market really blossomed and continues to boom, but it, it's not seen as special or desirable anymore. Some leaps forward in food manufacturing were about bringing more into the home. Others were about what and how we ate outside of the home. This was a shifting trend powered by industrialization. People were working around the clock and further from home than ever before. Fast 
food as a category is also something that's always been with us. People have always eaten street food. It becomes a really American phenomenon after the Second World War when we begin to see chain fast food restaurants. So the early versions, what we think of as a fast food restaurant, a hamburger stand, is something that emerges both with industrialization, with the need to feed people who've been on the night shift. People who are coming off the night shift in a factory need to be fed. So little carts would come up to the factory gates to feed them. That's an early version of what we think of as fast food now. The food came to the people. And then with the popularization and democratization of car travel, then there's a new market of people who need to eat while they're traveling. We were eating outside the home, but not in a traditional sit-down restaurant. Eating food that was cased in disposable wrappings, drinking from cups with straws. At first, they were made from paper, but this new way of consuming food eventually gave rise to single-use plastics. The ripples of the post-World War II industrial boom were also felt in the way we accessed entertainment. For many years, we listened to radios and went to the movies. Then, moving pictures came into the home. Early versions of the television as we know it date back as far as 1926. First, there was Scottish inventor John Logie Baird and the world's first mechanical television broadcast. At three o'clock this afternoon, the television service was opened by the Postmaster General using the Baird system. A year later, American engineer Philo Farnsworth had successfully demonstrated the first electronic television. From here, the race was on to make television units that could be mass produced and sold cheaply to consumers. But the television couldn't stand on its own. To create a market for it, consumers also needed to see a need for it, and that required content. In the early days of television in the United States, the Radio Corporation of America, which had a lot of radio broadcasts, under the management of David Sarnoff, created the NBC or National Broadcasting Company, which started making television broadcasts, but also started to mass produce television sets for the consumer market. And it was the most influential corporation in promoting the spread of television and television broadcasting in the United States. Television, a new public service produced by combining RCA laboratory science with manufacturing skill. It's interesting when we look at the spread of television, in fact, that perhaps it didn't spread as fast as it could have. Initially, it was slowed by World War II because the American economy essentially became a managed economy by the government with all of production basically part of the war effort. But after World War II, and as a result of improvements in mass production, the production of television sets became relatively inexpensive. In 1946, only 7,000 TV sets were sold in the U.S. In 1948, yearly sales had grown to 172,000. In 1950, 5 million sets were sold. Over the course of the 1950s, the TV became a fixture in most homes. In 1950, just under 20% of American homes had a TV. By the end of the decade, almost 90% had one. This was also the decade that saw the next great leap in TV technology, color. In April 1954, RCA shipped their first color TV to market, the CT100. The CT100 wasn't the first option on the market that year, but it was the first color TV to ship in large volume. It had a 15-inch screen and a picture tube containing 600,000 phosphors, which emit the light that creates the picture. The unit also had 35 receiver tubes, 150 feet of wiring, and 1,012 other parts. Compared to the average black and white set of the day, which would have had around 400 parts and less than 20 tubes. The TV was produced in RCA's factory in Bloomington, Indiana. The production line was over two city blocks long. When it was released, the CT100 sold for US $1,000. It would take nearly 10 years for technology to evolve enough to make color TV something everyday people could afford. And for the volume of color broadcast to make buying a color TV worth the investment. Whether it was black and white or color, 
The rise of the TV brought the world into our homes. Television, for the first time, really created a world system in which a far-off event was something that you could experience and live in a, in a kind of a visceral way. Today, more than 1.4 billion households own at least one TV set. That represents almost 90% of all homes in the world. Television is the quintessential mass-produced, mass-media technology. Before the internet, it had an unparalleled influence on how we consume information. It also redefined how we access entertainment. Over time, the TV made other home-based consumer technology possible. Video game culture in the 1970s was very social. People were experiencing games together in bars, in pubs, in corner stores, very sort of public spaces. And it was all about you and the people that you were with. While arcade games were one of the emerging technologies in the early 70s, the popularity of the television posed a unique opportunity, one that engineer Ralph Baer recognized. In 1966, he began working in earnest on a way to play games through a television while working for defense contractor Sanders Associates. The result was the Magnavox Odyssey, released in 1972. It included multiple game options, accessed by inserting different circuit boards. And you might think of these circuit boards as cartridges like in later games, but they're not because the games are already in there. All these circuit boards did is unlock a game, same as turning a switch. But it, it was uh, innovative. And with any Magnavox TV, 17 inches or larger, you save $50 on Odyssey. The Magnavox included one game in particular that has become synonymous with the emergence of video game culture. It involved two dots on opposite sides of the screen, bouncing a third dot between them, similar to a game of table tennis. New gaming company Atari released a similar game as an arcade machine, known as Pong in 1972. It proved to be hugely popular. In 1973, a year after its release, 2,500 Pong units had been sold. By the end of 1974, this had reached more than 8,000 units. Over its lifetime, Atari sold more than 35,000, and they sold it for three times the amount it cost to manufacture. Atari wasn't the only company benefiting from the popularity of Pong. The Odyssey was not a big seller initially, but then when Pong came out, the Odyssey was the only way you could play a Pong-like game at home. So that, that's what really pushed the sales. It had kick-started this interest in video games and more broadly, this fascination with playing with the screen. On the other side of the world, another important development was about to take place. In Japan, international imports like Pong couldn't crack the local market. Nothing could beat the widespread popularity of Pachinko, a Japanese game that was similar to a vertical pinball machine. What began as a children's game in Nagoya before the war is now big business. Until Japanese company Taito and game developer Tomohiro Nishikado took a stab at a new kind of arcade game. Their most prolific designer decided to take a electromechanical game called Space Monster and turn it into a video game. The result was Space Invaders. Released in 1978, it was a revolutionary game where you didn't just shoot at the enemy, they shot back. Also, Space Invaders was the first game where you had a high score. So kids now start playing it, trying to beat everybody's high score. Space Invaders was a game that was endless if you were good at it. At the time, arcade games were created through a planned network of circuitry and electronics on an arcade board. Nishikado wanted to work differently. He believed he could design the game as software operated by a microcomputer an idea only limited by the processing power of computers at the time, much of which Nishikado had to custom build to support the game software. One of the most interesting things about the game is the way that it actually gets faster. It's actually a result of the hardware in that as the aliens get destroyed, it frees up processing power so the aliens move faster because it, the computer can process them more quickly. But it actually results in this beautiful um, gameplay flow. The success of Space Invaders didn't end at the arcade. 
In 1980, Atari released a licensed version of Space Invaders for their Atari 2600 console. And this was at a point too where there was this real focus on, on trying to recreate the arcade experience in the home because it was expensive to go to the arcades. Atari Space Invaders is widely considered to be the first killer app, that is, a game that people will buy a console to be able to play. And sell it did. Atari's gross income in 1980, the year Space Invaders was released for the 2600, doubled from the year before. They took in a massive $415 million. In that year, the company accounted for one-third of Warner Communications' net income. Space Invaders remains widely attributed as helping to kickstart the video game industry. Video games and video game cultures were incredibly important to the 20th century. I think that they were the first creative medium, the first art form of digital technology, which proved to be one of the most world-changing inventions of an era which contains so many world-changing inventions. And I think it's impossible to underestimate how significant that was, both for culture, for leisure culture, popular culture, but also for society and technological advancements more broadly. It may have started as a 20th century phenomenon, but the industry has endured and shows no signs of slowing down. Today, it is worth more than 135 billion US dollars. It's projected that the video game sector could be worth as much as $196 billion by 2025. There are more than 2.5 billion video gamers in the world, spending around 80% of their gaming money on software. That is, games to play on a device they already own. Well, the video game industry today is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's ahead of the movie industry, it's ahead of the record industry. But the record industry is itself a pillar of mass-produced entertainment, one that has survived through many iterations of technology and distribution models. The means to create recordings of music date as far back as the late 1800s. But in those early decades, the recording industry had a problem. Recordings were made on a cylinder and played on a phonograph and these couldn't be mass-produced. Duplication was needed to meet the growing demand, necessary to turning sound recordings into a consumer product. Before 1900, you couldn't mass reproduce these recordings. There was no way to do that, and so you could only make one recording at a time, or maybe a few recordings at a time. So many companies marketed these recordings as originals, in the sense that even if the singer is gonna make 40,000 takes of the same thing to make 40,000 records, each one was unique. In 1900, when mass reproduction became possible, that all, all changed. The phonograph may have created a market for sound recordings, but the gramophone gave them what they wanted. It played a circular disc that could be stamped out by a machine, making it possible to mass produce. The disc was 10 inches in diameter, turning at 78 RPM, with a 10 millimeter hole in the middle it remained the prevailing standard for nearly 50 years, making its own mark on the music industry. 78 RPM records, you could only fit three or four minutes of music on a side, which is why pop songs became three or four minutes long. But the length of these records made it prohibitive to record the high prestige stuff like symphonies and operas. And since classical music was prestigious, that was a real issue. So the LP is invented in the late 1940s to allow you to record more music, and it's slower. It's 33 and a third revolutions per minute instead of 78. But no matter what type of music you prefer, or whether you want it on 45 extended play or 33 and a third long play, every record is made with the same care and to the same high fidelity standard. For much of the 20th century, records in one form or another remain the most popular means of mass-produced music recordings. At its market peak in the early 1980s, vinyl record sales brought in two billion US dollars from sales of over 300 million records. But by then, records had a new competitor, one that offered something this fragile medium couldn't. Of course, with this Sony Walkman, which emerges in 1980, that really changes everything. It became clear that people were willing to give up sound quality for the convenience of portability, because cassettes don't sound as good as reel-to-reel -reel tapes, MP3s don't sound as good as CDs, 
et cetera, et cetera. People were willing to make that trade-off for convenience and portability. The evolving production and portability of music continued from the days of the Sony Walkman. Then came a new technological development that transitioned the distribution of music recordings off the assembly line. It's as simple as typing in a song and clicking a mouse. How we buy our music has been transformed. Retailers are being undercut, manufacturers sidelined completely, and the record company's margins are being squeezed. Music, television, the computer, and video games define mass-produced mass media in the 20th century. Then, in the 21st century, they all came together in one tiny unit. One that redefined our consumption of mass media and how consumer goods are mass produced. The smartphone as we know it today had its genesis in 2007 with the release of the first Apple iPhone. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. It combined mobile phone, internet, iPod music download and storage capability, and video playback in a device that could be held in the palm of a hand. Yeah, it's a breakthrough phone. If it was nothing but a phone, it would be a breakthrough. It's a very powerful phone that's super easy to use. This tiny device has created an unprecedented level of connectedness to information than ever before in human history. There are more than three billion smartphone users in the world. They spend over $100 billion a year in mobile phone apps. Nearly 40% is spent by Chinese users, and more than three quarters is spent in games. Smartphones are part of a multi-billion dollar consumer electronics industry, an industry in which the world's leading tech companies don't manufacture their own products. They have turned to manufacturing nations like China, contracting huge third-party factories to mass-produce their goods on an assembly line shared with other brands. The contract electronics assembly factories are absolutely staggering in their scale. You know, there are factories that have 300,000 or more workers in a single factory complex. They're physically extensive, you know, they're cities unto themselves. One of the largest among them is the mega factory run by Taiwanese electronics manufacturer Foxconn. Located in a historically impoverished province of China, the factory is known as Foxconn City. Foxconn called its landmark plant informally Foxconn City. And that's appropriate because they often have dormitories for their workers, they have cafeterias, they have everything from cyber cafes to wedding gown shops, you know their whole kind of industrial cities that have developed uh, for the manufacturing assembly of these kinds of goods. At Foxconn City, about half of the world's iPhones are manufactured by a workforce of up to 350,000 people, giving rise to another nickname, iPhone City. In the months before a new iPhone is released, Foxconn City will pump out 500,000 phones a day or up to 350 a minute. That is nearly six iPhones per second. Across mainland China, Foxconn employs 1.3 million people. They are the largest private employer in the country. Alongside the iPhone, they build products owned by Dell, HP, Samsung, and LG. Smartphones have changed the face of mass production and perhaps not always for the better. Consumer electronics may carry a luxury price tag, but they are manufactured for as little as possible. How exactly this is achieved is often a tightly held secret. Today's giant factory differs from the giant factory in the past in that it tends to be hidden, not displayed, not an object of national or company pride. Part of this, of course, is these companies are not dealing directly with consumers. Foxconn customers is not someone like you or I, it's, it's, it's a company like an Apple. So they don't really need to promote their own physical facilities. The other thing is they want to hide proprietary methods and products, and they don't really want people looking at their labor process. There have been a lot of instances of exploitation, of health and safety problems, and so forth. So uh, the less known about these places, the better. So it once was that famous photographers would publish photographs of factories, and these would be in giant magazines like Life Magazine in the United States or the equivalents all over the world. 
Today, you almost never see a photograph inside the factory where the shoes that you were wearing were made, or the cell phone in your pocket where it was made. Stories of extreme, unrelenting working hours and the speed at which workers are expected to turn out product are grim. Foxconn found their factory practices in the spotlight in 2010, after 14 workers committed suicide. Deaths that were attributed to desperation over poor working conditions. Ma Xiangjian was dreaming of a better life. He got a job at Apple manufacturer Foxconn in the southern city of Shenzhen, but he fell to his death from his dormitory at the end of January. Labor activists are getting increasingly worried at a wave of suicides of the Taiwan-based company. As long as the demand for goods persists, the drive to make them as cheaply as possible will too. With a new product coming out every year, the cycle continues. Electronic products are in some ways a fashion object. You know, I mean, when there's a new model coming out of Samsung or iPhone or, you know, whatever, there's an enormous rush. You know, these things are marketed almost as if it's, it's the annual fashion show and they are unveiled and everyone rushes. And, and, you know, in the case of, for example, Apple, literally millions of units of new phones are purchased in the first weekend of sales. So this means you need the capacity to ramp up production enormously. This is an industry that relies heavily on people to manufacture their goods. Automation is not the most cost-effective way to manage the constant ebb and flow of a manufacturing cycle. It is still humans that complete the complex and intricate production processes. This lack of automation is not limited to electronics manufacturing. Humans are at the center of another behemoth of modern mass production. Mother and her friends might be discussing plans for the day, but I'm sure they're talking about a favorite subject, fashions. Clothing is really interesting to me because it's technically a light industry. It's not very capital intensive. Garment factories can open up anywhere in the world with a very small investment. And even today, in the 21st century, as many as 65 million people work in just the garment and textile part of the trade. The fashion industry relies heavily on a human manufacturing workforce. It has since the early days of mass production. In the early 20th century, conditions in clothing factories were, you know, they were sweatshops. People worked really long hours. There were really no laws protecting garment workers. In those days, the factories were operating in areas like the Garment District in New York City. Migrants would come from Europe and Asia to work their way up to the American middle class, a dream that for many remained out of reach. And despite the cheap labor and the large volume turnout of product, the price of clothes in the early 20th century was still high by modern standards. I think that today's consumers would be shocked by the price of clothing in the early 20th century. Even clothing in the 1950s or 60s would seem really expensive to us today by comparison. And as a result, people just owned a lot less clothing. You might open your closet and see nine dresses instead of today where consumers often own hundreds of items, which seems normal to us now. By the middle of the century, the accessible consumer fashion industry as we know it today was emerging. In the 50s and 60s was when you really started to see the average person able to consume clothing just as a fashionable product. We also started to see the rise of youth fashion. It's kind of hard to imagine now, but prior to that, it would have been too expensive for a young person to rotate through clothing or to keep up with fashion. Look, I've got some new records. Let's try them. But first I have to decide on the material for my new dress. Oh, just like a girl. Always thinking about new clothes. As clothes became cheaper to buy, consumers became more open to the idea of owning a much larger array of items. And then came fast fashion, pioneered by companies like Zara, who celebrate that their clothing can go from concept to manufacturing to stores in 15 days. They're not alone. Other leading clothing brands have access to similar manufacturing capability. 
Forever 21 can do it in six weeks and H&M in eight weeks. The shift towards cheap, fast clothing was accelerated through radical changes to free trade in the mid-90s. What happened was really overnight, the American garment and textile trades were outsourced. It happened in the blink of an eye. So that was really the beginning of this shift to high volume, very low cost production in a way that we had never really seen before. This allowed high profile clothing brands to separate completely from manufacturing of their products. For many, many decades, products were associated with their manufacturer. And a company like Singer or Chrysler Motors or Volkswagen, you know, designed the product, they manufactured in their plant, and they often controlled the distribution. Today, that's much less true. One of the earliest major brands was Nike. And even though they're sort of thought of as a quintessential American company, they were, from the beginning, a design house, but they never actually manufactured anything. That design the product, they market the product, People buy it because it's got their name on the product, but they don't make it. Even in the earliest days of that company, they were more about marketing and branding than about making a physical product. In a country that originated disposable consumerism, ironically, these over-designed, high-priced hunks of plastic and rubber have become fantasy objects. For many years, sports apparel companies like Nike and Adidas manufactured most of their products in China. Rising factory worker wages in China are causing them to turn to even cheaper options. Nearly half of all Adidas shoes are now manufactured in Vietnam. Chasing the bottom line to deliver low-cost clothing to consumers means that the separation between the factory and the brand owner has never been wider. There are virtually no major clothing companies today that own their own factories. The industry has split to where you have brands who essentially sell a lifestyle. They're, they sell you on the idea of fashion or the idea of a cool product. And then you've got this whole supply chain of people making clothes behind the scenes that's usually on the other side of the world from the brand. Conditions in garment factories haven't changed much the location of those factories has. As with electronics manufacturing, this is a contracted manufacturing industry that operates behind closed doors. Contracting has a lot of different benefits. One is it's sometimes able to find lower labor costs by sort of scouring the world for, for cheap places to make stuff. And not only can you get lower labor costs, but you put a little distance between your brand name and the labor practices used to make it. So, if children are being used in Bangladesh to make it, it's a lot easier if the factory where they're working doesn't have the name of your company on it. Often, their practices aren't widely known until they make the news. In 2013, the Rana Plaza building in Bangladesh collapsed in less than 90 seconds, killing 1,134 of the people who were inside manufacturing clothing for high-profile international brands. The horrifying tragedy dragged the unsafe working conditions in these factories into the spotlight, leading to the accord on fire and building safety. But this industry is a seemingly unstoppable behemoth. In Bangladesh alone, it employs around 5 million people, more than 10 million in China, and over 12 million in India. The demands of mass production have also inherently changed the very nature of the clothes we wear. If you go back to the 1800s and look at what people had on before ready-made clothes, the fashion was very elaborate. Lots of fabric, lots of layers, lots of tailoring, lots of structure. Everything was asymmetrical. Everything was ostentatious. And once factory production came along, that just didn't make sense. Everything needed to be more standardized. So what's really happened is we're wearing more and more simple designs. Our clothes have less fabric in them. They're lighter weight. They're literally and physically more disposable than they used to be. I also think they're less interesting as a result. 
clothes are cheap to make and cheap to buy. They are lighter weight and seemingly disposable, and we often treat them that way. It is a constant cycle of production and purchasing, with only one inevitable conclusion. I think when we globalized the clothing industry 20 years ago without any labor or environmental standards, it set off a race to the bottom. It's the reason why the industry is unsustainable. It is the reason why clothing companies create too much stuff. Each year, the fashion industry produces over 100 billion garments. In the same period, 87% of disposed textiles are sent to landfill or incinerated, not recycled. The type of cheaper fabrics that prevail in the fast fashion industry are also destined to become an environmental burden. For the most part, we're either wearing fossil fuel fabrics or we're wearing natural materials made out of cotton, wool, and silk, which is all the kind of older materials that we're more familiar with. So fast fashion and cheap fashion would not be possible without synthetic materials. And those are the fibers that are made directly out of the feedstock of fossil fuels. Here's a piece of a cloth we make from coal and other things. It's called nylon. But how can a soft thing like this come from a hard thing like a piece of coal? So that's your polyester, your acrylic, your spandex, your nylon, and that's uh, what's in a majority of the clothing that we wear today. More than 60% of fabrics in use are now synthetic, many made from the same material, polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, that is used to make plastic bottles. About two-thirds of the PET manufactured worldwide is used to make clothes. That is 50 million tons of plastic. And the reason is quite simple. They're much cheaper than natural materials. And I don't think a lot of consumers realize they're wearing another type of single-use plastic, essentially, when they wear cheap clothes. When these synthetic clothes end up in a landfill or as microfibers in the ocean, they won't break down. We can't put the genie back in the bottle. We have to take the clothing industry that we've got and make it as sustainable as possible as quickly as possible. I think that one of the biggest challenges facing this industry is the fact that it's growing so fast. Consumers all around the world want to shop like we do. Every year, the industry is consuming more water, more oil, more energy. It's emitting more water pollution, more carbon emissions. So I think that there is this kind of tension right now between sustainability and growth. And I hope, I really hope that we can find a way to balance the two. But in a consumer-driven industry, change is possible. More clothing brands are now open about the factories they use, the wages they pay factory workers, and how environmentally sustainable their operations are. They're responding to consumer pressure. People want their clothes to be made sustainably. No one wants to feel bad when they get dressed. Companies are getting better at understanding where the impact is happening in their supply chain and figuring out how to shift it to greener methods. Mass production has added incredible value to our lives. From Henry Ford to fast fashion, it is an industry born out of the desire to reduce costs through efficiency and repetition. Giving consumers access to technological marvels in manufacturing innovations that wouldn't have been possible without the economy of scale mass production provides. But as goods become increasingly cheaper, we value them less. We discard and replace. Mass production has led to an unsustainable level of mass consumption. This is the next great challenge of manufacturing. In an industry fueled by innovation, it is waiting to be solved by the factories that will define our future.